Well, hi everyone, I'm Timothy Simmons, and uh, this is Song and Everything Using Musical Improvisation to Empower Diverse Learners. And uh, what I want to do with you uh, today is uh, kind of explore three really simple goals. One, I want to talk about places where language and music intersect. Um, and to do that, I want to talk to you about how to improvise with your students in the music classroom. And I want to show you three simple structures that I use to begin improvising. So I want to talk to you about those structures, show you how to use them, model them a little bit with you, so that you can take those away with you and try them right away in your classroom. Um, let me give you a little bit of background about myself. Uh, I'm a music teacher. I'm based in Paoli, Pennsylvania. I work at Delaware Valley Friends School, which is in Paoli, Pennsylvania. And uh, DV Friends is a school for uh, students between grades 1 to 12 uh, with learning differences, mostly dyslexia, uh, really severe ADHD, executive function uh, disorder, auditory processing delays, those kinds of mostly language-based impairments. Um, and I'm the music teacher for all the grades from grades 1 to 12. And I should tell you that uh, I've been teaching for 27 years. Uh, for 17 of those 27 years, I have taught both English and music at the same time. I've jumped back and forth between two subject areas. And working as I do with students with learning differences, I kind of began to see some relationships between what was happening in the music classroom and what was happening in the English classroom. And I started to ask questions about how those two areas were reflective of one another and started to use the answers that I found to those questions to develop kind of my own curriculum just to use with my students in my classroom uh, that worked with them. See, the thing is, is that some students learn differently and some students um, can't process information as the way other students can. Um, and they need a way to access concepts and they need a way to access skills that is a little different. And that's what I was finding with my students in music. And I realized that there was a feedback loop that was happening between how they were processing language and how they were creating music. And the connection that helped them kind of access music that I found for my students was improvisation. And specifically, improvisation really targets areas of the brain where music and language overlap and intersect with each other. And there's two areas uh, that I find really, really compelling for uh, helping students both learn to be good musicians and also for remediating and addressing some of those areas where they struggle with language. And that is their ability to synchronize with a pulse and also their ability to hear melody. And so we're going to talk a little bit about those today and look at um, some simple forms that you can use. So there are three structures that we're going to use today. The first one is called One Authentic Sound. The second is called The Infinity Loop. And the third is called Catch Me If You Can. And I'm going to show you how to do these three structures. This is the process that I use to teach students how to improvise on a variety of instruments and a lot of times uh, instruments that they've never played before. But before I get to that, I also want to say one other thing. When I use the term improvisation, um, I'm aware of a couple of problems that this might bring up. Number one, um, for those of you who maybe have studied music and are really highly trained, you know, as well as I do, that you can't just have someone with no experience begin to improvise. Um, and so I want you to understand that this term improvisation, for me, refers to um, not the kind of improvisation that takes years of training, but rather an approach to musicianship uh, that is accessible and fun and kind of game oriented. I often compare it to a game of soccer. You know, when you go out to play soccer, there's a bunch of rules that you have to follow, right? And both teams have agreed to those rules. And so when you go out onto the field, you follow these guidelines, but every game is different, right? So what I try to do is let's just start with some simple guidelines to kind of access your instrument, to access your voice, your music, and then let's build from there. The other thing that I want to mention that might be problematic with using improvisation is that it, what I'm going to be asking you to do is to kind of flip your thinking as a music educator. And 
the mantra that I use with my students a lot is all music begins with one authentic sound. And that's going to be the first structure that I'm going to teach you, but I want to talk a little bit about what this means. So first of all, let's talk about this word sound. I'm using the word sound very specifically because I don't mean note and I don't mean pitch. I mean sound. Note and pitch imply a right or a wrong note. And I want to kind of get away from that thinking of a right note or a wrong note for the beginning of this process. And instead, give my students a space where they can just make a sound and just begin there. Um, also, it's one sound. At any given point in time, my students are only responsible for making one sound. So this is really the answer to the question, what's the most simple thing that I can teach my students to get them started? Make one sound. And so we're going to show how you can use that to kind of build today. The third term in this is authentic, and authentic of course means honest, right, and true. And really, instead of thinking about what I want you to play, instead thinking about what you have to say on the instrument. How are you feeling, and how can you express that on the instrument? And so that's kind of my beginning focus. That's a total flip as a music educator between, um, you know, thinking about right or wrong notes and scales and modes and these kinds of things that we use to give our students a vocabulary for expressing themselves, right? What I'm kind of doing at the beginning here is really throwing that out the window and starting on the opposite end. And the reason I'm doing that is that what I found with my students is that they really struggle to remember sequences. Um, they cannot process letters and signs, symbols on the page the same way that other students can. And so what can we do to set that aside for a minute? and open the door where they can access music and access this in a way that really expresses who they really are. And then we can bring this, these structures into a kind of a more mainstream approach where we're talking about some of those other uh, elements of music. This approach really works well also with my, my little guys and my uh, middle school students who come into the classroom and are just looking for ways to channel their energy. And these are games that we play to kind of get them started. So at this point in time, I'm going to invite my daughter over. This is my daughter, Emerson. Sure. Why don't you come over and just say hi first? <laughs> Hello. <laughs> you want to grab your bass? Emerson is a bass player, and uh, she improvises with me a lot, and she's going to be uh, helping to model these three games that I'm going to show you today. <laughs> We're in my basement, and... Uh, the base hits the ceiling. Okay. You ready? Yes. Cool. Okay. So uh, we're going to start with one authentic sound. So again, uh, this is a mantra that I say every day with my students. All music begins with one authentic sound. And so uh, here's how I lead them through this exercise. So um, sometimes we use our voices. Sometimes we use our instrument for today. Uh, since Emerson has her instrument here, we're gonna we're gonna go right into the instrument. You ready? Okay. So Emerson, uh, what I want you to do is just stand on your own two feet. Be as relaxed as you can. Okay. Um, and if you're comfortable, close your eyes and just kind of focus on your breathing for a minute. Breathe in through your nose, out through your mouth. And I want you to think for a second about what you might be feeling right now. Maybe you're a little bit nervous. Maybe you're hungry. Maybe you're tired. And I just want you to quietly name that feeling to yourself. And now that Emerson has kind of gotten in touch with what's happening in her body, I'm going to ask her to open her eyes. And I'm going to signal her through some breathing. And the three signs are this, which means get ready. I'm going to gather the air like this, which means breathe in. And then release, which means breathe out. Okay? And we're going to use this as a way to conduct her through some breathing and then through some playing. Okay, so let's just start with some breathing. And Emerson, what I want you to do is just put whatever you're feeling into your breath and see if you can express that 
in your exhale as you breathe. Okay. So the concept here is that the music does not come from the instrument. It comes from the musician. And so the first thing we want to do is get in touch with what we're feeling in here and then put that into our breath. And then we're going to do the same exercise, but Emerson, as you breathe out, I want you to make a sound on your instrument. And, you know, Emerson has all her positions memorized, you know, and so it's sometimes it's hard to kind of unlearn some of those things that we've been taught about right or wrong note, right? And that's okay. You can play a note. You can just make a sound. Whatever you think expresses what you're feeling, that's where you're going to start. Okay, and what I'm going to do is I'm going to do this uh, four times with Emerson, and I'm going to lead her through this, making four sounds on her instrument. Okay, here we go. beautiful. So notice what I'm trying to do is not only invite Emerson to make a sound on the instrument that expresses what she's feeling, but to connect with her in the process of making that sound, right? That she's really looking at me and feeling my breath and my movement as it leads her into that sound, right? So we're really connecting with what's happening in the body and really trying to put that into our music. Okay, so that is one authentic sound. The next structure that I use with my students is called the infinity loop. And it's a really basic structure, really based on ostinatos. Um, and so the way this works is this. I'm gonna ask Emerson to make one authentic sound, and then another authentic sound, and another, and another, and kind of string them together until she finds three or four sounds that she likes and that she thinks they sound good together. And then what I'm gonna invite her to do is to repeat those sounds and make them into a groove. Now, this is where things get really interesting because making something into a groove and really creating a pulse that others can synchronize with, this is really intimately connected to the ways in which we process language. Research shows us that our ability to connect with a pulse is intimately connected with how we process language. And so this, um, I have found over the years that with my students, especially with my more dyslexic students, uh, this is something that's really challenging for them, is creating a pulse and then locking into that pulse with others. This is something that takes sometimes months to really kind of bake into their playing. It's been a lot of time hitting a cowbell, just to get them to lock into a pulse, so moving their body. So, but what she's gonna do is she'll just start with one sound and just start stringing those authentic sounds together and then try to create a pulse out of them, okay? The other thing that she's exercising here is she's listening for melody. So I have a really simple definition of melody, really simple, and it is this. Melody is one authentic sound followed by one authentic sound followed by one authentic sound, followed by one authentic sound, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, okay? And then, so what you're gonna to try to do is just string together some sounds, try to remember where you, where you put them, and then try to repeat them. And I'm gonna pick up my guitar, and I'm gonna play with you, but I'm gonna wait as the other member of this improvisation. My role is to listen to you first. And when you feel like you've gotten a groove going, kind of nod to me and see if you can signal to me. And then my job as the accompanist will be this. I have two choices. Choice number one is imitate what I hear, okay? Or add something new. And then what we'll do is we're each gonna keep grooving like that for a couple of minutes and just repeating what we did 
on a loop for infinity, the infinity loop, until we feel like we're ready to end, and then we're going to see if we can end together. Okay, so this is the infinity loop. Emerson will begin. She's going to create a repeating pattern. She'll nod to me when she's ready. I will imitate or add something new. We'll find a way to end together. So right now, I'm listening to what she's playing, and I'm trying to move my body to the pulse, right? I'm gonna try to connect with her right away. Now notice, she's using a triple time feel. This is really common. A lot of students will automatically play something that feels triple time. I had a, a drama teacher years ago tell me that, you know, we practice in fours, but we live in three a lot of times. And this is so natural. Also really challenging for others to connect with. So sometimes I will ask students to adjust and kind of go into a more explicit four. But we're going to go with this right now. Now I've been talking, so I may have missed her nodding at me. She's looking at me like, I'm ready for you. Good. Did you see she nodded her head? So that's a nice cue. So I'm just gonna start anywhere and see if I can find something that I think works with her. find a way to end together. Woo! All right. So um, I, when I use this exercise in my classroom, I will often use uh, a set of ORF xylophones or um, some bells that are uh, diatonically tuned. Uh, sometimes we'll sit together at the piano in small groups, maybe two or three, and just play the black keys and just use that as a way to just kind of give the students a way to just kind of access this really simply. Okay, so that structure is called the infinity loop. Now, these two exercises, One Authentic Sound and the Infinity Loop, are ways in which I begin almost every lesson that I do with my students uh, because these are basics of just accessing music that I want them to just become really comfortable with and so that they can do automatically. They can get a little boring sometimes though because you're just asking them to repeat the same thing over and over again. This leads us to our third structure for today which is catch me if you can. And uh, this is really simple. The way it works is uh, the group decides on a leader. Do you want to be the leader? Okay. Thank you. <laughs> you have no choice in this matter. Um, Emerson will be the leader. And what we're going to do is we're going to do the infinity loop structure, the exact same thing. She's going to play some sounds until she can create a groove. She's going to nod to me. I'm going to add something new or imitate what I hear. But then things will change a little bit. And the way this will work is once I'm connected, and Emerson sees that I'm repeating myself also. She has to kind of listen to that, right? And see, okay, he's with me. Um, what she's going to do is change. And you can change in any way you want. You can speed up. You can slow down. You can get louder. You can get softer. You can move the melody to a new place. Um, however you want to change. The only thing that I would recommend is try not to do anything too wild. <laughs> um, just something simple. Add something into it. And then what I need to do then is listen to those changes and see if I can follow Emerson and follow those changes. And we're going to kind of go back and forth and see where this takes us. And what we're doing is we're turning this improvisation into kind of a conversation. 
You know, uh, some people argue that the, the, the human mind is designed to improvise. Every time we have a conversation with each other, we're improvising together, right? We don't plan these things out beforehand. And so what that means is then a little bit of give and take, right? I listen and respond and listen and respond. And at the same time, we're trying to connect with that pulse, really connect with that beat and really listen for the rise and fall of the melody and hear how those sounds are connecting together. And then in that way, we're really giving ourselves kind of a full brain workout where we're exercising uh, how we listen to each other. We're exercising uh, some skill on the instrument, whatever that is, whatever instrument you're using. Um, and at the same time, we're really addressing some of these um, aptitudes, which are really essential for language processing at the, also. Um, and it's also a blast if we can really get it going. Um, you ready? Yeah. Let's try this. <laughs> You're the leader. So notice Emerson has adjusted already. She's going back into four. Really simple and nice and clear. She looked at me. Um, so that's called Catch Me If You Can, and you can see, um, you know, it, it can be really funny. And what it does is it just kind of opens the door to let anything happen. So these are three structures for just beginning the process of um, approaching music kind of from a bottom up way, right? Starting with what you're feeling in your body to making a sound to connecting those sounds together and then building from there. The beautiful thing about improvising with your students is that it is scalable up or down in any direction. Um, you can use these structures any way you want. Uh, look at the needs of your students and ask yourself, well, how can I use this game in a way that really meets what they need? Um, sometimes my really experienced students who are really great musicians uh, they really know their notes and they have a lot of technique, but they're not very good at listening. And they really struggle with really hearing what everyone else in the room is playing. Uh, they just kind of focus on what they're doing. Uh, this process will open that up for them. Uh, some students, I've had some students who uh, were really afraid of music uh, because their prior experience of music uh, was all about right, wrong, right notes or wrong notes. And they couldn't remember sequences and they couldn't read the notes on the page. And so this was a way of opening the door for them in a gentle, kind of humanistic way. This says, just start with one sound. What are you feeling? And you only have to make one sound. Just start there. Um, and so it enables us all to kind of meet together in the classroom and begin making music. Um, for myself, because I work with students who learn differently, this is almost everything that I do. But um, what I encourage you to do is to Look at the needs of your students and see if there's a way uh, that you can incorporate one of these three exercises into one of your lessons, really to um, address some of those needs, those listening needs, 
your ability to kind of connect with a group, and especially to really ask yourself about your students who might learn differently from others and ask what they need and see if there's a way that you can help them access music. Thank you so much for watching this video with me today, and thank you, Emerson, for playing with me. She was amazing. Um, again, my name is Timothy Simmons, and uh, I want you to know that I do have a website. The website is songineverything.com, songineverything.com, and uh, that will be uh, available in some of the support materials that I'll provide for this. I also am going to share uh, directions for these three exercises, as well as two other exercises that we didn't go over today uh, that you can use in your classroom that are uh, help you connect some of these pieces together a little bit more. So please look for those and use them with your students. And thank you so much for uh, listening and for um, watching this with me. And I hope you use improvisation and I hope it's fun for you and empowering for your students. Thank you.